Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar. I'm going to give everyone just a few minutes to join in before we get started today. So hang on uh, just a minute or two, and then we'll get started. Okay, great. We'll let some of the others trickle in, but I'll go ahead and get started on a little introduction for you all. I want to introduce myself. I'm Carly Cipolla, the Director of Operations for the American Solar Energy Society, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on our monthly webinar series. ACES is a 501c3 nonprofit that was established in 1954 and advocates for sustainable living and 100% renewable energy by sharing information, events, and resources to cultivate community and power progress. Again, welcome to the December webinar where we'll be watching the recorded keynote from Solar 2020 Renewable Energy Vision. This keynote um, specifically is called the Clear Vision for Worldwide Action. Before we get started on today's webinar, I'd like to give a short update on ACES programs. Our 50th annual National Solar Conference information pictured here is Solar 2021, Empowering a Sustainable Future, will be taking place in Boulder, Colorado at the University of Colorado Boulder from August 3rd through 6th, 2021, next summer. The call for participation is out now, so please head to aces.org slash participate2021 to learn more and submit by January 15th, 2021. So just one month left to submit to the call for participation. Also, the 25th Annual National Solar Tour was held virtually this year in 2020 and had a great turnout. Um, you can still head to nationalsolartour.org to watch all of the content from this year's tour and be sure to save the dates for next year's hybrid tour. Uh, that will be October 2nd through the 3rd, 2021. Uh, the latest Solar Today magazine will be released in the next few weeks, so be sure to join ACES for access to our Solar Today archives. We're also currently running a membership drive and are asking you to join, renew, or gift an ACES membership. Learn more about all of our membership options at aces.org slash join. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at membership at aces.org. Learn more about upcoming ACES events and our partner events at aces.org slash aces events. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters today in the recording from Solar 2020 Renewable Energy Vision. The clear vision for worldwide action opening plenary sets the stage for the full conference and provides an overview of where we were at and what is needed to accelerate the energy transformation. The impacts of the major global disruptions due to COVID-19 are underscored in these discussions. Joining moderator and stage setting presenter Scott Sklar are Dave Renee, the immediate past president of the International Solar Energy Society, and Dennis Hayes, the founder of Earth Day. In addition to discussing the current state of technical and financial innovations, they will reflect on the important role of public acceptance, policy, and advocacy in the energy transformation. So please enjoy this recording from Solar 2020 Renewable Energy Vision. Do you have any questions or comments? All righty, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started with the recording today. Um, I'd just like to let you all know that uh, we are accepting the uh, call for participation papers. Those are due by January 
15th, 2021. So just a month left to submit uh, there. And you can join ACES at aces.org slash join to learn more about our memberships and uh, be the first to know about anything happening with ACES. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started here. We've got the clear vision for worldwide action with moderator Scott Sklar and speakers Dave Renee, the immediate past president of the International Solar Energy Society, and Dennis Hayes, the founder of Earth Day. Please enjoy. Hello, Hello. everyone, and welcome to our second session. Today's keynote, Clear Vision for Worldwide Action. If you're just joining us, my name is Carly Rixon. I'm the executive director here at the American Solar Energy Society. This year has been a disruptive one, and that's part of what the solar energy is. We are trailblazers. We are leading the edge of innovation. When there's a challenge in humanity, when the going gets tough, the solar industry steps up, we always have. We innovate and we disrupt. It's what we always have done. So let's continue to challenge ourselves and each other. We have the technology not only at our fingertips, but in our hands. ACES has created a powerful call to action for Solar 2020 participants. It's an opportunity to add your name to our community, proclaiming that we are committed to letting everyone know that 100% renewable energy is not only possible, but profitable embodying the triple bottom line of valuing people, planet, and profit. And being fossil free leads to a thriving economy and world. This is about urgent climate action. Please find the call to action on our website, aces.org slash conference and join us. The hashtags are mission possible and hashtag fossil free and flourishing. A few housekeeping items before we dive in. Um, we held our division caucus yesterday and we'll be holding divisions elections next month. Um, this is for uh, leadership and we're taking nominations for self and others for eight technical divisions. The officer positions are for one term. If you're interested, please send us a bio and a position statement to info at aces.org by July 7th. I should note that the technical review committee, which is comprised of the divisions, always does a superb job of curating the content of our annual conference, so thank you. Please check out the lounge in the exhibit hall if you haven't already, where you can visit some of our sponsors and partners and view the technical posters from our poster presentation. A big thank you to our sponsors this year, Panasonic, Sologistics, Aspen Hill Films, Solaqua, and Elsevier. I'd like to express my highest appreciation for the ACES staff and board of directors and all of our interns and volunteers. I'd also like to recognize our Solar 2020 National Organizing Committee that really stepped up and did a fantastic job of pivoting this conference to virtual. The NOC is comprised of Paulette Middleton, Scott Sklar, Elaine Hebert, Dara Bortman, John Essig, Robert Foster, and a special thanks to Carly Sapola, our conference director for her leadership. And a shout out to all of the Sapolas in the house. Great to have you here. We invite everyone to join us this afternoon at 4 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Eastern for the annual ACES Awards and Fellows Ceremony. It's going to be a lot of fun, led by our ACES Awards Chair, Larry Kazmersky, and special guest, Bill LeBlanc. It's on a different, free platform and you can find the link to attend um, on our website as well as in upcoming notifications. Our board of directors has pledged $5,000 to match dollar for dollar your donations to ACES during the conference. If you don't give it, they won't either. That's how much we are counting on you for your support. The board match is on. Please go to our website aces.org and click donate at the top. We also have conference t-shirts for sale as an ACES fundraisers. I'll put the link in the chat. We truly hope that you enjoy this virtual conference with 15 sessions and nearly 100 speakers. Now I'd like to kick off today's keynote session, Clear Vision for Worldwide Action. The session has a lineup of dynamic speakers and is moderated by our disruptive Solar 2020 conference chair, Scott Sklar. 
I already introduced him, but uh, one more time. Scott is the president of the Stella Group, a strategic clean energy technology optimization and policy firm. He's an adjunct professor at the George Washington University teaching courses on renewable energy and critical infrastructure. Scott Sklar is also the energy director at GWU's Environment and Energy Management Institute. Once again, thanks, Scott. We're sad we can't be with you at GWU, but glad you could come with us. Scott? It is wonderful. And again, I, I want to tell everybody, ACES is the oldest renewable energy organization in the United States of America and uh, has had a long history and involvement in getting us where we have been. Um, I also want to thank uh, George Washington University because we were going to plan it in Washington. That was originally. Uh, obviously, because of COVID, we couldn't do it. But my colleagues at uh, the directors of GW's Environment Energy Management Institute, uh, Professor Deason, Professor Cascio, I, I wanted to recognize them. Um, we are in a very pivotal time. And that is be not because of just COVID. It is not only because we have rapid climate change, it is also because we have several other issues that are confronting our global society. We are in a water shortage problem. We, we have 3% of all water on earth is clean. And half of that is not even accessible. And we are having rapid climate change, which is changing accessibility of water. And it's looking like half the planet in the coming decades will not have enough water to sustain itself. And by the way, to think that we can desalinate our way to salvation is actually not really pragmatic. So we have that. We have, frankly, uh, 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 terrorism and cybersecurity problem, which is transforming how we look at grids and moving to microgrids and self-healing grids for energy and different ways to work to sustain ourselves from those who want to harm us. And we also have, I believe, an issue on how do we deal with uh, half the planet that does not have access to either energy, clean water, enough food or appropriate uh, nutrition and, and safety. And they're going to be migrating because of changes in our climate and political instability. So we have many issues that we have to face uh, in, in this and why I'm so proud that ACES has stepped up and said 100% renewable energy has to be the vision of the future. We have picked a panel today or a set of presenters that really are world class. And I will introduce them all personally before they go, but I just want to say Dennis Hayes was the godfather to me, and I got involved in this in the 1970s, in my thinking. He has been a mentor, and he has been a driver for many of us in the earlier days and right to the present on how we should create a global vision for clean energy and sustainable development. And I just have to say, Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we also have Dave Rene, and Dave has been uh, president of ISIS, the International Society, and been involved in, in, in the National Energy Laboratory. And I've known David for decades, and also, I think, not only a great thinker, but somebody who has tried to bring uh, uh, the, active, to the thinkers and activists together globally. And, I, and it's, good, it's exciting that he's here. And we also have um, Charlie Gay, who was actually one of the earliest uh, private sector people I met in uh, solar energy in the 1970s, and has not only uh, led companies in solar, but ran the solar program recently at the US Department of Energy, and also is a amazing thinker in terms of how we grow and develop. And of course, we have Tomas, who brings this international perspective that I'm really critical in, in how we're, we're doing here. So I hope in our presentation and what we do, we can, um, we can entice you and, and get you into this. So with that, 
I'm going to do a presentation of the theme of this conference. Let's see if I can get this working here. And one second, slideshow. Okay. So as Carly said, I've run a company for 20 years that blends all these technologies together. And I am hired around the world. I have projects on every continent. So I obviously don't have favorites as long as it's clean. High value energy efficiency, all the renewables, and all the different kinds of energy storage. And by the way, I was awarded in 2014 the Charles Willie Abbott Award by ASIS. So thank you, ASIS. And I, as I mentioned before, I teach three interdisciplinary courses on sustainable energy at George Washington University. Because my belief is you can't understand energy unless you understand business, unless you understand engineering, unless you understand law, unless you understand environmental science, unless you understand international affairs and many other disciplines. And I try to build that in. And one of my courses is the first in the country on renewable energy and critical infrastructure, which I'm very proud of. And we'll talk about that. So I'm going to run you through the sort of the thinking on 100% renewable energy as fast as I can so Carly doesn't get upset at me and throw me off the panel. So here we are. I love this chart. I take other people's uh, pictures as best I can legally. And this is DLR out of Germany. And this was part of the, um, the Greenpeace report on 100% renewables. And you can see in this chart, we have a lot of renewable energy on this planet. It's not 100% economic to access all of it, but frankly, with all that we have, it's pre, uh, you don't need 100% to of it. You can do a very small percentage and meet those economic guidelines. And so we have 2,800 times more solar energy than we need as a planet, an energy source, wind 200 times, uh, geothermal from the earth, 100%. 24-hour power, uh, biomass that's sustainable, not growing. That's our waste, the biodegradable waste, by the way, that are degrading the methane and adding to climate change if we don't figure out how we access it. Uh, hydropower one times, and that's not building dams. That's just using existing dams or free flow hydro and wave and tidal two times. So we have a huge amount, sorry that wrong, sorry, huge amount of renewable energy to access on this planet. Um, I love this chart from McKinsey and company because they're looking at disruptive technologies. And as you can say, re see renewable energy is on the top left, advanced materials, why you can have wind turbines sitting in water or the new concentrators for concentrated solar power that we talked about in the earlier panel, uh, new kinds of photovoltaic materials. It's really driving battery energy storage and you see the battery on the left hand below. All of that material science renaissance has changed the dynamics, lowered the cost, increased the life of the systems we're putting around the world. And then on the right is the internet of things. And why I'm teaching a course on renewable energy critical infrastructure, because we're using renewables to power the internet, data centers, repeaters, a lot of the things we need to keep the self-healing grid of information and the self-healing grid of communications operable. And at the same time, I'm using those tools to make sure that microgrids and these other systems with renewables are working so seamlessly and are reliably. So that's going on. And so what we're seeing, when I grew up and had hair on my head and my beard was dark, every plant was built, generation plant in the United States and probably really around the world, was built by the utility company. And it changed to only less than 50%, and that's traditional power. But then we started to sort of follow what happened in cellular and telecom and the internet to create uh, distributed grids, self-healing grids. When a cell tower goes down, the cell communication network doesn't stop. They sense the loss and they triangulate around it. When a data center goes down, by the way, which happens every damn month, uh, the, grid, the internet doesn't go down. It senses and triangulates around it. And what we're trying to move with still some central station power, but production along transmission lines, 
at transmission substations, at distribution lines, at distribution substations, and at the end use, the building, the factory, the office building, is a mixture of energy sources tied to energy storage, tied to sensors and controls. So if a power line goes down, we don't shut down. There's no reason for that. And by the way, I have two self-powered buildings in Arlington, Virginia that do not need the grid and I'm working just fine. So my thesis for you today is the maximization to get to meet our climate change goals, right? In the time frame we need to do it is you must have the maximization of high value energy efficiency. We have to reduce the energy loads before, we, before it even makes sense in a way to drive renewables in. Why do we wanna power things that are overusing and wasting their energy? How ridiculous is that? It adds to the cost, it adds to the time frame. And as I tell my students, it is always less expensive to save energy than generate it from the energy, from, from any energy source. And then the entire portfolio of renewables, I see this nonsense coming in between um, uh, fights between technology. We need to meet the climate change goals, every single renewable as sustainable though, not just drop down. And so uh, we'll talk about that. And then energy storage, we have lots of kinds of energy storage. So obviously you know about batteries, we have pump storage, we have compressed air and liquids, we have uh, weights, we have flywheels, we even have hydrogen. So at any rate, uh, that's, um, that's uh, what we need to think about. No one or two renewable energy technologies can meet 100% of this very big world. You really need to maximize and, op op and optimize it. And we need it in every single sector, buildings, industry, transportation, infrastructure, and energy production and transportation. And lastly, you know, I know there's been some whining about biomass, but we waste a lot in this world. We waste it in our food system, we human sewage and animal waste, uh, crops. Uh, there's a lot of waste that you have contaminated grains, you have rotting crops, you have pieces you can't use. And after you plant, you put back about a third of it back in the soil, what are you gonna do with the rest of it? You're gonna let it all go into methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas by at least 25 times. Now only 300 years in the atmosphere, but we need to capture that waste methane and we need to do it fast and use it. So there it is. So I'm just gonna go through a dance to meet my time frame here so I don't get in trouble. So uh, ACEEE based here in Washington, the think tank for uh, energy efficiency just put out a report in 2019 that US energy usage could, uh, we could half it cost effectively with energy efficiency. And not only that, we could do it faster than building generation on any of it. So why wouldn't we as a society want to do that? Right now, energy efficiency meets 18% of US energy, which means that if we didn't do it in the past, we'd need that many more power plants, gigawatts of generation. That's what that means. And in 2018, uh, the federal lab, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, put out a study looking at real efficiency put in the marketplace. And guess what? It's about two and a half to 3.3 cents using energy efficiency rather than generating it. You can hardly get anything generating at 2.5 cents. So the point here being is it is low cost and in many cases much faster to do. So uh, you know, this is from IRENA, and we're going to, again, have talk of information about IRENA. I don't want to get too much into it, but we've had 176 gigawatts uh, or 176 nuclear power plants worth of renewable power capacity in 2019, mostly from solar and wind, but a lot from the others. And so I just wanted to put that information in for you. And, you know, we have in 2018 about $1.6 in investment. Um, I think in 2019, some of the data I've seen 
is about 2.3 trillion in investment. So we're, we're going up and that's all good. It means private sector is, and the investment community is putting money in these fields. Why? Because it is economic and it is less disruptive. You know, who thought we would have uh, some of these issues we're facing with riots around uranium mines and obviously the fight, fights between Saudi Arabia and Russia on oil and uh, the sun, the wind, the water, the heat from the earth and our wastes are not gonna be disruptable. I love this study. This is a study done by uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and they've done a couple of versions of this, but this had the prettiest map, so I used it. And this shows that 32 states can be totally self-sufficient with the renewable resources they have on a sustainable basis with technology we have today. And, and by the way, this did not include offshore wind or tidal and wave. If you just put offshore wind on this map, you'd have New York and Georgia and New Jersey and some of these about five other states totally at 100% as well. And of course, remember we have transmission lines, which means the states that can't be 100%, you can shove it right to them pretty easy. So, I mean, this is visually, we have the capacity, we have the sustainable resources in all the renewables combined. Uh, I love this map, this is a very recent one and it's e Energy Information Administration they'll put out by the American Wind Energy Association on, uh, this is 2018 numbers, on the percentage of the states where wind is contributing to their electric generation. And we have many states, you know, uh, over 30%, Oklahoma and Kansas, uh, Iowa, we have some over a quarter, New, New, uh, North and South Dakota, of course, and, uh, but it's significant, uh, 21% in Maine. The point being is, we have a lot of capacity, not only in the low population states, but even in Texas and California, for instance, where uh, they're really significant contributors. Um, this came out by Navigant Research uh, last year, and we're starting to see plants that are less than natural gas. We're already been a while less than coal, which is why coal's declining so rapidly. But this is a great, uh, uh, a great article, and I've been involved in some plants. Where we've come below, actually, photovoltaics with storage below natural gas, new natural gas peaker plants. The technologies are coming down, and because we're, we're, we're producing so much, the cost of money to invest in these projects is also going down. And so this is a REN21 that just came out, the study, it's a World Bank supported study on the renewables and shows what's, uh, you know, where renewable power on the planet's coming from through 2019. This was released on June 15th, 2020. And so you see the renewables all, we're talking gigawatts here. So that's astounding. And, and then I just put some operational PV. Can, you know, when I started this in the 70s and Dennis Hayes was there and Dave Renee was there and Charlie Gay was there and, you know, I would talk about 500 gigawatts. I was laughed at. I was working in the U.S. Senate in the 1970s. And I, when I talk, I had the head of the, one of the energy committees put his hand on my shoulder and, Scott's, and said, Scott, I love your enthusiasm, but there will never be gigawatts of solar. There will never be gigawatts of wind farms. And so it is almost incredulous uh, to think about what's happened uh, since all of us on this panel, many of us who started this way. And then I put some information from FERC. So when I give my students at GW 36 studies on going to 100% renewables, I don't have the time to go over these studies, but I'm just gonna highlight. So Greenpeace with that DLR study showed we could meet 100% uh, renewables by 2090. Uh, ACES with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Dave Renee was part of this. I, actually, I believe he pushed this. A 200-page report on tackling climate change. And here it was bringing down carbon emissions by 60 or 80%. I'll show you a chart on that. Google.org did a study which showed we can go 100% electric renewables. Just uh, it would cost us 4.4 trillion as an economy. 
but we would recoup, we would recoup 5.4 trillion in savings and we could do it by 2030. So this is that, that ACES study with NREL. And as you can see, the big purple on the top was 57% energy efficiency. And what did I say earlier? It's the lowest cost and the fastest, and it lists all the other renewables. And the National Research Council, National Academy of Sciences said we can meet almost all of our electricity from renewables. I just showed you the Institute for Local Self-Reliance map. Um, concentrated, oh, MIT, number six on top, they did a study with a bunch of experts to show that we could be 10% of US electricity with the geothermal on, in the country. We had economically, and that's not just the West, 50% of it was on the Appalachian Mountains, which are actually an older chain. And remember, most of the electricity on this planet's created from heat. We're creating steam. That's what we're using, uranium, oil, natural gas, uh, coal. It's just to create, heat to create heat to create steam. We are 9,000 degrees in the middle of the earth. We got plenty of heat, renewably. And concentrated solar panel uh, power, a uh, couple of different studies on this showing that we could meet 15% of our electricity in this country from the deserts primarily with concentrated solar, which is 24 hour power. So, and then I included an NREL 2018 and a Navigant 25 studies showing that we could meet um, about one third of US total electricity from US rooftops and parking lots. Uh, that's a lot of potential for solar. Uh, that um, that uh, water power, uh, there was, this is, this is now not talking about dams. This is either upgrading dams that exist or, but free flow, no dams or diversions, tidal wave and ocean currents, conservatively 10% of US electricity, 24 hour. And most people, by the way, in any country live either at the shores or along rivers. So it's power where you need it. Waste heat isn't thought of as a renewable resource, but I do uh, because it's just put out there by industry and buildings why wouldn't we want it? Um, and then these are the 100% studies, uh, looking at Jacobson studies for the, uh, that he presented at the UN, Scientific American 2015, uh, the uh, IIACA study, 100% renewable energy for Europe and North Africa, the World Wildlife Fund study, 100% renewable and sustainable energy by 2050, uh, the, the UN International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the availability of wind sun could provide up to 77% of the world's energy needs by 2050. Um, so, and, and just going on and on, a biogas study by the Nicholas Institute at Duke University could meet 5% of, of our energy market. Uh, the uh, Lapine Naranta University had 100% renewable energy plan, probably one of the best uh, energy studies in this group uh, put out in November 2017. Waste can meet 12% of U.S. electricity needs. Uh, by, this is looking primarily landfill gas. Um, so uh, the, another European report on uh, meeting energy uh, and looking at this, 100% renewable energy in the uh, uh, Stanford University report that I referenced earlier. This was the one before it. And I had my grad students look at all these different studies. And just looking at the US and taking the most conservative con conclusions from the studies. And this is what they pulled out. These are the most conservative conclusions from all these 100% or near 100% studies just in the US. And this is where it would come from. And I want to remind you, the water energy, the waste heat, the concentrated solar, the geothermal, and the biomass power, right? So we're talking about 43, 53, over almost half, over half of it is 24 hour power renewables, right? And then you have wind energy, 20%, but variable, distributed solar, variable, and then the buildings, renewables, geothermal heat pumps and solar daylighting and solar water heating. And all of that meets more than 100% of our energy needs. And that's the point. And it's all economic today. That's the point I want to leave you. So uh, we're not the only ones who are crazy. 
The Orlando government actually approved a resolution to go 100% renewable energy by 2050. Uh, so uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, try and move 100% and joined six other cities that have moved in that direction already. And then uh, states are holding fast according to Pew Trust this year on their clean energy agendas, even with the pandemics. And we are just, and this is a study done uh, looking at transformation of European energy. Uh, Germany has exceeded 50% renewable energy use milestones. And we are looking at all these hydrogen economy, another way to make renewables uh, or and make hydrogen via renewables, uh, breaking water down uh, and, or other kinds of uh, uh, minerals uh, to hydrogen. Uh, this is where the geothermal capacity is in the United States, but you see them starting blipping up along the Appalachian chain. This is the concentrating solar projects around the world I referenced when our Department of Energy speaker was talking about in the first panel. And actually this is uh, a year and a half old. There's more in Morocco now and in China and in Australia. And I wanna leave you since I've gone over my time and Carly don't hate me forever, but I wanna point out that we live on this nest. This is where we live. This is, uh, I was good friends when I worked in the Senate in the 1970s with John Glenn, our first astronaut, who was a senator from Ohio, a uh, coal state, voted with us all the time on solar and renewable energy. And I asked him why. And he said, because when I was in that space capsule, and he said, I believe there's life on other planets, but they don't look anything like this, and they don't look like us. He says, I realized for the first time, this is our nest. This is our home. And so I want to remind you, everyone on this conference, and to talk to your friends and your relatives and your acquaintances, this is our nest, and it is our responsibility to preserve this nest. So with that, uh, I, uh, going over my time, we are going to um, show, a, I believe, a video uh, with Dennis Hayes of the Bullet Foundation. But again, I want to tee up Dennis. Um, Dennis uh, was one of the conceivers and implementers of the first Earth Day, uh, the this, this Sunday, which was the innovation side for renewable energy, and uh, that allowed uh, networks to develop and awareness to happen that never, ever happened before about our environment, about sustainability, about renewable energy. And he worked at World Watch Institute, which was an environmental think tank. And he did a series of monographs. I have all the original ones. I have them on my desk. They were the first time I actually read not dense technical papers on why we needed to move in this direction. And it was um, game changing for me as a young professional working in the Senate of what we needed to do. So I am a, um, um, honored beyond belief to have Dennis on this panel, and I, I hope you uh, enjoy what he has to present. Thank you. Take it away. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for those altogether too kind remarks. Not at all, Dennis, too short, sorry. Uh, as, as you were talking about us as this collection of geezers, uh, it, it occurred to me that the first talk that I ever gave about the solar revolution that was directly linked to the climate crisis was a keynote for the American Association for the Advancement of Science back in 1980, which is to say we've been pushing what we're talking about in this panel and at this conference now for, in my case, a little bit more than 40 years. And I'm kind of all talked up with a big sweeping visionary, the running through the, all the different technological options, the what have you. And, and there are so many people on this panel who just like Scott with his uh, compendium of resources uh, can, can address that so effectively that I'm going to be doing something quite different from the title of the, the session and make just two broad points, um, both of them fairly controversial in some circles. And then in keeping with the bromide that a picture is worth a thousand words, I'm gonna go swiftly to a video that shows what happened when my foundation set out a few years ago with the uh, ambitious goal of building the greenest office building in the world. And 
part of being the greenest, of course, is to be energy self-sufficient. But first, those two broad points, uh, the controversial ones. Carbon taxes, carbon dioxide taxes, gasoline taxes, cap and trade, upstream cap and option, and other price mechanisms have absolutely dominated climate policy debates in the United States now for more than a quarter of a century. Advocates, that's to say mostly the environmental community, but not exclusively the environmental community, have spent more than $1 billion seeking congressional support for such policies. Uh, in terms of the actual effect, they might just as well have flushed a billion dollars down the toilet. But what would have happened if we'd succeeded? I'd like to explore sort of an extreme case. Let's say that we had put a small tax on carbon dioxide in 1980. We'd ratcheted it upward a little bit every year. Now it's 40 years later, we might have ratcheted up to, let's say $400 a ton by now. I, I should say there is no national politician in the United States who would endorse $100 a ton. There's only a handful that would talk straight about getting $50 a ton. But look at $400. $400 a ton should have pretty well solved the climate crisis, right? Uh, well, let's consider it in a familiar context. $400 a ton would increase the price of gasoline by about $3.80 a gallon. That is roughly what many Europeans pay for gasoline today. Uh, and they have more efficient vehicles, but they have not made a bold transition into an energy and carbon neutral future. British Columbia has a tax on carbon dioxide that it raised from $35 a ton to $40 a ton last year. That's the highest tax in North America, among the highest in the world. That uh, raises the price of gasoline by 38 cents a gallon. Uh, not a revolutionary sort of change. In my state, Washington, relatively prosperous, relatively well-educated, relatively progressive, relatively green, the legislature wasn't able to pass any kind of a carbon tax in 10 years of trying, so citizen activists went out to pass it through a ballot initiative and put it on a ballot twice. This was a carbon dioxide tax that started at $15 a ton. We've gone now from 400 down to 15. It failed both times. Had it passed, it would have raised the cost of gasoline by about 12 cents a gallon. To be clear, um, well-crafted equitable taxes on things that we want to discourage, which definitely include greenhouse gases, are a good thing. Um, don't misplace that equitable that I had is one of those adjectives. But to make them the prime tool to solve the climate crisis is just foolish. They are relatively ineffective and they are wildly unpopular. They gave rise to the Yellow Vest movement in uh, France. They caused street riots in Iran. The most important impact of any plausible carbon or carbon dioxide tax will not be its impact on energy price elasticity, but rather how the revenues are spent. Second broad controversial point. We have now clearly run out of time to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees. It's always good to have your reach exceed your grasp, but that rhetorical goal simply can no longer be achieved. Moreover, having shot past it, uh, we're not going to be able to get back there in any time frame of relevance, even to your great-grandchildren. To instead limit the increase to 2 degrees C is still plausible, but it will require a mobilization akin to the one that produced the arsenal for democracy during World War II, and it will need to be continued not for four years, but for 30 years, and not just in America, but throughout the world. I'm talking here literally about a global Green New Deal that lays out a vision, like you're going to be hearing from all of the speakers this morning, a vision for the future of transportation and manufacturing and buildings and agriculture that looks very different from today's. And you're not going to get there again through price elasticities. You're going to get there, I'm afraid, through laws, codes, procurement strategies, really big subsidies to bring about rapid revolutionary changes. Now, again, that's what other people are going to be talking about the details. I'm going to focus down deeply on just one illustrative building that already exists, so ignoring transportation and industry and agriculture and looking just at buildings. This one is a six-story building that is net energy positive, and I 
six stories is important. You have roughly the same roof area. If you're one story, six stories, 80 stories, you're going to be getting your solar from the roof in most cases. And uh, six stories, it turns out, is pretty close to the maximum you can get anywhere. We remain, after seven years, the only true net zero, actually net positive energy six-story building, I think, in the world. It's also net carbon neutral, net water neutral. It recycles its gray water, uses only FSC certified wood, contains zero toxic materials, composts its human waste to make a soil enhancer. And in a sustainable world, it would become not something that is exceptional, it would become the norm for buildings. And in that sustainable world, instead of having the same kind of boring building in Minneapolis, Atlanta, and Phoenix, buildings would be designed for the location in which they're constructed. So now if the video is all queued up, let's see what such a building looks like if optimized today for Seattle, Washington. And, and Dennis, this has no, you have no sunlight in Seattle, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very little. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that in, sorry. Is there sound? There's no sound in this movie. There should be sound, I'm sharing my computer audio. Am I doing something wrong, Salman? What do you want to do? She's trying to get sound off that video. Uh, while sharing the screen, please uh, select the option that, that should come at the bottom. Share your computer sound. And the second option would be optimize yeah. uh, video quality. Yeah, Select both of the options and share. OK, let's try this again. Let me know yeah. if you can get here. Sure. We need to unshare and share it again. What was that? Stop sharing uh, the screen and share the screen again. And while sharing your screen, select both of the options that will come at the bottom, share computer audio, and the second option should be optimize video quality. OK, done. The Center for the University of Washington Center for Integrated Design. And in partnership with the Bullitt Foundation, for the past seven years, I've had the privilege of being the Center's tour program coordinator. Before we get started touring the Bullitt Center, I want to take a moment and introduce you to the Bullitt Foundation, a private philanthropy started by Dorothy Bullitt in 1952 with a mission to fund civic projects here in the Pacific Northwest. In 1992, the foundation hired Dennis Hayes to be the president of the foundation, and it was under his leadership the Bullet Foundation's mission narrowed its focus to invest in programs that safeguard the natural environment, advancing principles of ecology as they apply to human beings and to human communities throughout the Emerald Corridor. As we approach the Bullet Center from McGilvra Park, I want to frame this 15-minute tour around a central question or thought. What if a building could restore the ecology of a place? What if it could act like a Douglas fir forest? What if humans could design, build, and operate their built environments so that they abided by the same principles that govern the natural world? What would that look like? Well, thanks to an extraordinary integrated design team that included architects from Miller Hall, a Seattle-based architecture firm, PAE, a Portland-based mechanical and electrical engineering firm, Shukart, a full-service commercial general contractor, and Biohabits for their work on the building's water infrastructure design, we have the Bullet Center, living proof that we can design, build, and operate our built environments so that they restore the earth and inspire ecological stewardship. The Bullet Center has been heralded as the greenest commercial office building in the world, a model of true sustainability, a building in complete balance with nature. A certified living building, the Bullet Center sits in the middle of Seattle in a dense urban neighborhood. But before the city existed, this area was a Douglas fir forest. 
As a model of regenerative design, the Bullet Center was created to mimic the functions of the forest. So let's explore how this happens in a six-story, 50,000 square foot commercial office building. Just like a forest, the Bullet Center takes care of all of its energy needs from a clean, renewable source on site, the sun. Starting our tour on the top of the building, we're looking out at the building's canopy, a 14,000 square foot solar array designed to produce 100% on-site renewable energy for the Bullet Center. This system generates approximately 245,000 kilowatt hours of energy annually. For the past seven years, the Bullet Center has produced more energy than it needs on an annual basis, making it net positive energy. And that's amazing, especially when you consider that Seattle is one of the cloudiest major cities in the lower 48 states. You have to wonder, what's up Los Angeles, Phoenix, Miami, Boston, Chicago, or even Denver? If net positive energy buildings can be developed in Seattle, they can be developed anywhere. Like the leaves or needles of a tree, the panels convert solar radiation into energy that is used to meet all the building's energy needs. Excess energy produced flows easily to the grid. In other words, the bullet center is net metered. When the building was developed in 2013, the sun power panels used were the most efficient solar panels commercially available. With 575 panels on the roof, the bullet center relies only on clean renewable energy with zero combustion of any type in the building. This is critical if we hope to achieve deep decarbonization of our built environment by 2040. The Bullet Center uses ground source heat pumps to transfer heat energy from 26 400 foot deep geothermal wells to the building's radiant floor heating and cooling system. This system also provides heat energy used to warm the building's domestic hot water supply and to condition fresh air coming into the building from two rooftop heat recovery ventilators. A fully automated operable window system naturally ventilates and cools the bullet center during the hot summer months. Together with night flushing, the building uses an automated exterior blind system to help keep the temperatures inside comfortable year round. So again, like the forest, the bullet center is constantly responding and adjusting to its surrounding weather conditions. Also, like a forest, the bullet center must take care of all of its water needs and systems on site, net zero water. In the bullet center, there are three distinct water systems. Potable water, that's the water used in showers, dishwashers, and sinks. Gray water, that's the dirty water that goes down the drain after you've used the shower, dishwasher, or sink. And black water, that's the poop, pee, and toilet paper deposited in the building's toilets and urinals. 100% of potable water comes from treated rainwater. Rain falls on the building's canopy, drips onto the roof, and follows a drain spout into a 56,000 gallon rainwater cistern located in the basement. From the rooftop canopy to the basement, here we're standing in front of the rain to potable water treatment system. Behind the plywood wall is a concrete wall, one of four that makes up a 950 square foot room with a capacity of 56,000 gallons. Water treatment starts when captured rainwater from the cistern passes through a series of carbon filters, the smallest being half a micron. Filtered water is disinfected with ultraviolet light to ensure it is clean and safe. Finally, it is treated with a small amount of chlorine to ensure it remains safe throughout its journey to the faucets where it is used by building occupants. Now, chlorine was a hotly debated topic at the Bullet Center because it is a chemical on the International Living Future Institute's material red list. The project team originally tried to keep chlorine out of the building, but after much research and discussion with regulatory bodies, we all agreed chlorine was important to protect public health and ensure the project meets the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Moving on, next, the gray water treatment system. After water is used in the buildings, sinks, showers, and dishwashers, it goes down a drain and is captured in a 500 gallon gray water cistern before it is filtered and pumped to a third floor rooftop constructed wetlands. 
The next stop is the third floor rooftop constructed wetlands. Irrigation pipes buried beneath a bed of gravel, shale, and horsetail plants allow gray water to infiltrate the constructed wetlands. Water that does not evaporate or is not evapotranspired by the plants is released into a rain garden and bioswale at the ground level, effectively recharging the aquifer underground. Our analysis shows approximately two-thirds of the rain that falls on the roof ultimately returns to the soil, which is similar to the infiltration rate for a Douglas fir forest. And in this way, the bullet center is helping to reconnect the local hydrologic cycle. In keeping with our Doug fir forest metaphor, when needles fall off the trees, they land on the ground and decompose. The bullet center composts its droppings too. Our next stop is back to the basement. The Bullet Center currently uses a composting toilet system to treat the building's black water. Waterless urinals and foam flush toilets deliver poop, pee, and toilet paper to 10 aerobic composters. Four adjacent tanks collect the system's liquid byproduct, leachate as it's known, is regularly taken off site treated aerobically, filtered and disinfected with UV light to create Class A reclaimed water, which is released into a nearby wetlands called the Chinook Bend. To ensure public health is protected, the human biosolids produced in the composters are taken to a nearby company called Seattle Sawdust and Supply, where they are used to make a field-ready compost called GroCo. This soil amendment is sold to landscapers and homeowners to use on vegetable gardens and lawn maintenance. Next stop on our tour is the irresistible stairway. As a child, I loved climbing trees. The view from up in the branches never got old. In the Bullet Center, climbing the irresistible stairway is like climbing a tree. Composed of dug fir treads, the stairway offers some of the best views in the building. The stairway was designed to be the first thing people see when they enter the building. This positioning was intended to draw people up the stairs, using a large, open feeling and expansive views to encourage its use. In addition to creating opportunities for healthy physical activity, this strategy helps reduce electricity use from the elevator while promoting health. Of course, the Bullet Center does have an elevator, and it is in full compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. But for people who are able to use the stairs, we made the experience similar to the feeling of climbing up into a tall tree. Speaking of climbing trees and climbing stairs, our next stop is up to the sixth floor where we can appreciate the mass timber structure of the building. Like a tree, the bullet center is made from wood. When it comes from a responsibly managed forest, wood can be the most sustainable building material. In the case of the Bullet Center, Douglas fir dimensional lumber was used in the floor assemblies, which are nail laminated two by six boards that span 10 feet. The structural columns and beams are made from Doug fir glue laminated timbers, or glue lambs as they are known. 100% of the wood used in the Bullet Center is Forest Stewardship Council, or FSC, as you may know it, certified, meaning the forests were protected, even as the building relied on wood. In the Northwest, conventional industrial forestry relies heavily on large clear cuts and highly hazardous pesticides sprayed from helicopters and airplanes to extract as much economic value from the forest as possible. This approach can degrade ecological health and cause problems for people and wildlife. The Forest Stewardship Council requires forest managers to protect habitat for wildlife, avoid harvesting rare old growth forest, tightly restrict use of hazardous chemicals, and leave larger buffers along waterways. All of this and more results in better environmental and social outcomes. By using a mass timber structure, the Bullet Center reduced the embodied carbon and construction materials, which was a critical concern for the project team and a strong rationale for using wood. Plus, wood looks beautiful, brings biophilic benefits, and is a regionally appropriate material in the Pacific Northwest. 
Dug fir forests do not contain hazardous chemicals, and neither does the Bullet Center. Across more than 1,000 products, the project team screened out more than 350 chemicals, such as PVC, cadmium, lead, mercury, and hormone-mimicking substances that are known to cause human and environmental harm. This list is referred to as the Red List. We conclude the tour back on the second floor of the Bullet Center. Rather than leave the building through the main entrance, I want to take you out through the building's garage so that you can experience what a 21st century parking garage looks like. In addition to high-performance building, sustainable design also encourages high-performance humans. The Bullet Center not only relies on energy from the ground and sky, but also from the occupants. Set in a central, walkable neighborhood, the Bullet Center is in a prime location to be accessed by bicycle, as well as foot or transit. The Bullet Center provides no on-site parking for single occupancy vehicles, instead housing 29 bicycles. Like a Douglas fir forest, the Bullet Center gets its energy from the sun, its water from the rain, it contains no hazardous chemicals, composts its waste, uses wood for its structure, and it's beautiful. As a model of regenerative design, the Bullet Center was developed to show what's possible and to demonstrate that the built environment can reconnect long broken ecological cycles. In doing so, the Bullet Center is helping to restore its site. And by sharing this story, we hope to inspire others to do the same where they live, work, and play. As we conclude the tour, I'd like to leave you with words by Amanda Sturgeon, former CEO of the International Living Future Institute. Before you start your next project and try to cram in every sustainable strategy that you can muster, take a step outside and just ask, what would nature do? For more information about the Bullet Center, please visit bulletcenter.org. That's excellent. Uh, we're, I guess we're going to go through all the different panels and uh, all the presenters, and then we'll do questions and discussions. So thank you, Dennis. Um, I think the, the next presentation is Dave Rene. Uh, Dave has been a long time president of the International Solar Energy Society, uh, long involvement with the American Solar Energy Society, involvement with the, Amer uh, with the National Energy Laboratory, and, and a, a vital player in renewable energy for decades. So I'm real honored uh, to have D uh, Dave Rene and Dave uh, take it over. Thank you, Scott. Are you able to see my screen okay? I, I, it's unbelievable. I am. So you're doing oh, a good right. job for a guy without a beard. Unbelievable. Oh, I I finally Very figured impressive. this out. Yeah. Well, I shaved my beard off this morning, but I just, first of all, want to thank Scott for your great moderation of this. Scott is certainly a superstar, especially in seeing the kinds of growth that we're seeing in renewable energy because of all the great work he's done with the U.S. Congress on getting the policies in place. So thanks so much, Scott, for your contributions. And thanks to all the other panelists for your outstanding contributions as well. This slide is just, a, I'm going to, I know we're a little bit short on time, so I'll try to go through these fairly quickly. Um, this, this slide, I'm going to have to, first of all, minimize my, there we go. This is, um, first of all, this, this sort of highlights the, the problem that we're still facing. This is coming, comes out of the IEA uh, recent data, although this only goes out to 2017, I think. They have more recent data on carbon dioxide emissions, but here we see the challenge that we're facing. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but renewables is barely visible on this chart. We can see that the world is still dominated by fossil fuels for providing all of our end use energy need. And only toward the last few, last decade or so does the renewables contribution even start to show up here. So I think this is just a way to highlight what the problem is. And of course, of the one degree centigrade increase that we've already seen in global temperatures, coals can contribute to about a third of that. So this is a fundamental statement of the problem. Now, up until this year, of course, the carbon dioxide emissions were still growing. 
Uh, they reached 33.1 tons, gigatons per year this, um, this last year. But now we, because of the COVID, COVID crisis, we're seeing a sudden drop, about 8% is what the IEA estimates, or three to four gigatons less carbon dioxide emissions in 2020. This is the largest drop that we've seen ever in terms of total emissions reductions and, and, and also in percentage-wise, one of the largest since World War II. Now here's, the best way I can think of, this is a nice slide coming out of the Climate Institute that shows what we're really dealing with in terms of meeting our climate goals. On the left, you see the past emissions. Uh, back in 2007, the IPCC was looking for a two degree centigrade cap on global warming. And this black curve is what they came up with. It's what the emissions reductions would have to be, or the, uh, the uh, yeah, carbon dioxide emissions reductions would have to be. But as the science progresses, we're seeing more and more that we really need a 1.5 degree centigrade cap. And that's what the IPC reported on in 2018. But in the meantime, during that 10 years, carbon dioxide emissions have gone up. So now what we're facing is this red curve, which shows that we really have to be at zero or at a net zero energy system by the middle of this century. But if you look at what is being contributed by all the nations based on their uh, national uh, uh, com contributions to the Paris Climate Agreement, we're very far away from that. So we have a significant gap to fill between what the IPCC is recommending and where we are right now. But what I wanna show in my pre presentation is that the opportunities are still significant and they're gonna make great sense um, for us economically as well as socially. Um, here we are at the end of 2019. This is pre-COVID, of course, but we were adding more than 200 gigawatts a year of renewable power, primarily solar and wind. Uh, still a little bit in, in hydro and the other renewable resources, but we can see that the additions are uh, coming in at a very high level and most of our new power generation capacity, especially in the US and, and, and European countries, is coming from renewables now. And as Scott mentioned, the, the REN21 Global Status Report uh, just came out last week, the latest version, the 2020 version. We have now reached 627 gigawatts of installed PV capacity around the world with a growth of, of um, about 15% in the market since just last year. The, um, in the other tech, solar technologies, concentrating solar power, we're about, only about 1% of our solar electricity is coming from concentrating solar power. But the slide shows one very important point, and that is that there's a significant growth in solar thermal energy storage capacity, which is a significant attribute of concentrating solar power systems. Plus, this slide does not show that there are many projects in the pipeline, I think Scott mentioned some of these earlier, that um, are gonna keep this number going up quite, quite dramatically over the next few years for sure. The one area where we have some challenges is in the solar heating, thermal heating and cooling area. The capacity has actually dropped slightly this last year, primarily due to significant retirements of old systems and the slowdown in the markets, especially in China, which, uh, which historically has been the major driver of our solar heating and cooling markets. However, this doesn't show the fact that district heating and high temperature solar thermal process heating is, um, is a growing area and is actually making quite a significant contribution to this curve. From, a, from the perspective of, of the renewable energy share of electricity, the, the global status report shows that we're up over 27% now. Again, more than half of that is from hydropower, but you can see over here on the right that wind and solar percentage-wise are going up as, as they have been for the last few years. Solar PV is now almost 3% of our total uh, renewable energy, re renewable solar, or of our total solar, of our total electricity supply. And, but this slide is a, is a little bit more uh, important to consider, and that is, that, uh, and, and this is not, this has um, been in, published in the last couple of years in the Global Status Report. It hasn't changed much because I think this is still reflecting 2017 data. 
But here's the important point is that the power sector only represents about 17% of our final total energy consumption. More than twice of that or almost twice of that is, is tied up in the transport sector. And half of all of our total final energy consumption is tied up in the thermal sector. So uh, we see that the renewable contribution to power is the highest of these three charts in that in the transport sector, it's still very low. Um, again, I think these numbers have changed a little bit over the last couple of years, but this is the latest data that we have. But in the, both the transport and the thermal sectors, um, modern renewable energy and solar thermal and geothermal heat contributions are still quite small in the thermal area and renewable electricity is still a very small part of the transport sector. And so this is a challenge that we have to consider we know that we're rapidly electrifying the transport, or the uh, uh, we're rapidly electrifying our end-use energy uses, especially um, in developed in the developed world. Uh, but there's still many challenges facing us. We're in developing countries uh, as they have expand their electricity sector. They are doing it with old coal-fired power plants that they're purchasing um, from Asian countries. Uh, back in 2019, which seems like a long time ago now, the five-year prospects for re renewable energy growth in the power sector were very positive. You can see that the uh, 700 gigawatts was anticipated from just for solar PV, both roughly split between distributed and grid-tied systems, uh, central power station systems, and onshore wind and hydropower still being strong contributors to that. But that was until COVID-19. And these are more recent projections showing, uh, coming from the IEA that shows, for example, the top chart uh, shows uh, from a regional level that we expect decreases in uh, all regions in the total um, renewable energy market that's going to take place in this year. Uh, we do expect it to recover. However, there are many projects in the pipeline that maybe get delayed, but then still come to fruition by the end of next year. So there is, we do anticipate recovery. And in the bottom slide, you see the, um, the impact on the different renewable sectors. And of course, solar PV is this by far the strongest sector here, but it's also taking one of the larger hits uh, because of the many ways that the solar PV business works. Now, the IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency has come up with a recent report on uh, renewable energy generation costs. Again, these are for grid-tied power systems. And if you look at this curve, the uh, bottom portion of this chart is a grayed area that, costs a that is called the fossil fuel cost range. And you can see, especially um, on the left side, where biomass, geothermal, and hydro are all well within that range and even at the lower end of that range. But what's also significant here is that in the last 10 years, there have been dramatic drops, especially in solar, solar photovoltaic costs, but also in the other uh, renewable power sectors, concentrating solar power, offshore wind, and onshore wind. And all sectors now, all renewable sectors, including concentrating solar power, are now, now falling within or potentially even below what the current fossil fuel cost range is. And taking a closer look at the PV cost drops, uh, you can see on the left side of this chart, the total installed costs have dropped by about a factor of five over the last decade. And the capacity factors of solar PV have been going up during that same period of time. So this is giving us a significant drop in the levelized cost of electricity down to, we're getting close now to five cents per kilowatt hour. So this is uh, really a driver for what's happening in our solar markets. This is another way to look at it from the latest uh, solar power, uh, solar market outlook from the Solar Power Europe community. And you can see that utility scale PV is now at the bottom of the cost range of all these technologies, uh, below coal and below even uh, combined cycle gas technologies and uh, certainly below nuclear. Even utility scale PV plus storage, which is gonna be a significant uh, strategy for getting grid tied solar variable solar PV and uh, working successfully around the world is now falling within the range of traditional uh, power markets. And um, the rooftop solar area, of course, is, is uh, still quite a bit higher. And, and the second curve, uh, commercial industrial PV is also somewhat higher because, again, it falls under the category of rooftop solar. 
So utility scale solar is really dominating now the, the price advantages of the industry. Um, IEA just published a special report of the World Energy Outlook, and I don't want to get into the details too much here, but I think what's instructive here, and this is the kind of message that's very important to give to policymakers as part of our COVID recovery response, and that is that man the, the construction phase of these technologies creates a certain number of jobs per million dollars of capital investment, and by far the best job producer is solar PV and solar PV roof, utility scale and rooftop. Now, solar PV utility scale, because of its much lower cost, is also the most advantageous uh, technology for abating uh, carbon dioxide emission uh, uh, as well, carbon dioxide emissions as well. So uh, in the next five years, solar power in Europe in their, you know, in their global outlook, um, expects the COVID uh, impact to recover. Uh, if you compare this curve with ones from previous years, they're probably about 3% lower in terms of, of PV installed capacity projections, but you can still see that uh, sometime probably in the year 2022, the world will pass one terawatt of installed solar photovoltaic systems, rooftop as well as grid tide. And Scott mentioned a number of 100% pathway reports that have come out. I've been taking a close look at three recent ones. The IRENA remap study, um, I, they, they initially just went out to 2030, but just in, in their latest report, they went out to 2050. The University of Sydney uh, and the Energy Watch Group or La Perinta University in Finland. Um, the IRENA study, still makes assumptions that we're gonna have some carbon emission technologies in place by 2050. The other two studies, Sydney and Energy Watch Group, do not um, have any carbon emissions. They, they have assumed by 2050, the emissions will be zeroed out. However, they have quite different assumptions in terms of efficiency measures and other deployment strategies. So the numbers are quite different, but even so, if you look at the expected solar PV capacity required to meet these three studies, you see 8,500 terawatts from the IRENA study and 12,800 terawatts from the University of Sydney study. Well, over the past 10 years, PV has grown at the rate of 39% if you do a simple annual average calculation. And these growth rates mean if solar PV continues at about 9 to 10%, will reach these numbers, 8,500 and 12,600. So clearly the markets are well positioned to achieve these studies. And even if you look at the Energy Watch Group, which has a primarily renewable energy focused uh, scenario by 2050 with no carbon emissions at all, they, they project a 79,000 terawatt installed capacity per PV. And even at that, the growth rate that's required is only about 17 or 18 percent. So we're still within the realm of being able to achieve these significant numbers. So from my key takeaway messages, uh, obviously the pandemic is having a measurable, measurable impact on carbon emissions and, and of course on the renewable energy economy. And, and therefore the projections in the near term are for, re, are for re, reductions in renewable energy activity. But the historical growth in capacity and drop in prices for wind and solar is going to remain largely unabated in the longer term. And therefore, we, we are still quite optimistic about the future for renewable energy. And of course, the electrification of all Indies energy consumption will continue to grow, which is going to be a fa very favorable outcome for solar PV in particular. And in my view, 100% renewables by mid-century represents an essential energy system transformation that I see as both feasible, practical, and economically prudent. And this transformation will result in energy equity, security, and significant environmental and social benefits. So in closing, just to try and stay within the theme of this conference, uh, the creation of wealth and prosperity has been clearly powered by fossil fuels over the past two centuries. But this has also been leading to growing income disparities, energy injustice, and major environmental threats. But people are responding. And we're seeing a global revolution taking place to fight these inequalities, uh, to attack the environmental crisis, and 
and to protest against government inaction. And this response will be in transforming our energy supply into a renewables-based distributed system with universal access and democratization and therefore providing energy justice and environmental recovery and improvement for everyone. So this is my optimistic take on the COVID-19 response and our need to address the climate crisis urgently. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'll turn the, well, no, I guess, I, I guess I'll keep the floor, Scott, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yes, please. And um, introduce our next video, which was uh, prepared by uh, the, direct, the new Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, Francesco La Camera. Uh, he became the Director General at last year's uh, General Assembly meeting in January in Abu Dhabi. So he's been in the job now for roughly a year and a half. I've had the opportunity to meet him a few times. He's a very, he's a very thoughtful and he's provided us with a very thoughtful and um, interesting portrayal of how IRENA is seeing the COVID-19 response and it's in, 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 in the context of the longer term climate crisis that we have to address. So he, he very kindly submitted a video for this conference that um, I believe Carly is queuing up right now. And um, Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you at the 2020 National Solar Conference Renewable Energy Edition, hosted by the American Solar Energy Society. ASIS is a part of ARENA's Coalition for Action family, a platform that unites over 100 leading players from public and private sector around the world, with a common goal of advancing the uptake of renewable energy. ASIS's work continues to be very important for the coalition and beyond, as we combine our effort to accelerate renewables and drive the global energy transition. In response to the dramatic economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis, Coalition for Action members release a joint call to action, calling for a green recovery based on renewables. It puts forward eight recommendations to governments, encouraging a rapid and sustainable economic recovery aligned with the climate and sustainable objectives. For the short-term actions, Coalition for Actions members recommend to ensure that renewable energy projects can fulfill their obligation and put policy in place to promote renewable energy solutions. For the long-term measures, the recommendations include implementing policies that prioritize renewables, phase out fossil fuels, and facilitate a job creation based on sustainable energy. They also recommend to provide financial support and mobilize investment to renewables, as well as to strengthen international cooperation to accelerate renewable deployment. The call to, actions, the call to action recommendations echo the finding of IRENA's global renewable outlook. The outlook reveals that accelerating renewables and making energy transition an integral part of the COVID-19 recovery will bring massive socioeconomic gains to countries. For example, renewable energy jobs will nearly quadruple from 42 million and employment in energy efficiency will expand to 21 million by 2050. Of the 24 million jobs created under ARENA transforming energy scenario, about half will be in the solar industry. More than 7% of global renewable jobs will be created in North America. This is due to the steep decline in cost, rising installations, and relatively more labor-intensive processes than in other energy industries. The outlook describes an ambitious, yet realistic energy transformation that will set the energy system on the path needed to keep the rise in global temperatures at 1.5 Celsius. 
at the end of this century. While meeting Paris Agreement climate goals, it promised more jobs, higher economic growth, cleaner living conditions, and significantly improved welfare. The energy transformation would require investment up to 110 trillion US dollars by 2050. But every dollar spent will bring returns from three to eight dollars. Cumulative GDP gains could, could amount to 98 trillion of US dollars between now and 2050, greatly exceeding the additional investment needed. All regions can expect a growth of economy by 2050. North America alone, alone will increase its GDP by 1.5%. As I have argued in the past, renewable energy investment are the future. I believe that volatility that we have seen in other parts of the energy sector will boost the attractiveness of renewables as a long-term investment based in their already strong business case. Arenas recently launched renewable power generation costs in 2019 that show that renewables increasingly beat even the cheapest fossil fuel costs offering tremendous potential to scale up renewables and stimulate the global economy. The trend of falling prices is led by solar PV, as the report finds that utility scale solar PV power has shown the sharpest cloud decline at 28%, followed by concentrating solar power at 45% since 2010. We could expect that in 2021, up to 1,200 gigawatts of existing coal capacity cost more to operate than new utility scale solar PV. Ladies and gentlemen, placing the energy transition at the center of global and national recovery plans will enable us to overcome the current economic downturn and tackle the climate crisis. In doing so, we can achieve a step change in the pursuit of healthy, inclusive, prosperous, just, and resilient future. By the end of this month, IRENA will present a new policy report that outlines key considerations and energy-related recommendations align energy post-COVID recovery with long-term energy and socioeconomic sustainability. I would like to thank the Coalition for Action members for their continued collaboration and especially ACES for providing a platform to exchange ideas and business insight to push the renewable agenda at a faster pace. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to thank the International Renewable Agency for sharing that video with us and for Director General LaCamera's comments about ACES. Actually, uh, the International Solar Energy Society did play an active role in de developing that uh, document that came out of uh, the Coalition for Action a few weeks ago. And so now I'm pleased to have one more presentation to announce. Again, another superstar of the renewable energy world, Charlie Gay. I've had the Honor and privilege of working with Charlie since uh, the NRO days back in the late 1990s. And even after Charlie left NRO, he and I had the opportunity to travel to Tibet, which um, and saw some very interesting activities taking place over there in the solar, in, in terms of development of solar energy. Uh, Charlie has just recently retired from the Department of, Department of Energy as the um, head of the, the Solar Sunshot Program, the Solar Energy Technologies Program. And he will be sharing a video with us. And also, I, it's very important for me to mention that Charlie was last year's Abbott Award winner of the American Solar Energy Society. And it's an honor for us to have been able to present that to him as well. So now I would like to uh, ask if we could key up the video from Charlie. I'm not seeing it on my screen. Here we 
go. Thank everyone for the opportunity to at least speak with you remotely uh, for an introduction and for the uh, gracious opportunity to uh, join you here at the ACES uh, meeting. Uh, first, to thank everyone for having uh, taken the time to uh, tune in and to be a part of our virtual conference. And uh, especially to thank ACES for the uh, recognition with the Charles Greeley Abbott Award that I was uh, fortunate to receive last year. Uh, it's truly an honor to have been associated with ACES for all these years. And ACES represents a, uh, a node, a connecting point for uh, many different kinds of stakeholders to be able to find each other to learn from each other and to apply the insights at ever increasing speed. As I've been working in solar for almost 46 years now. So uh, there's a, a, certainly a kindred connection that I have with all of you who are participating here today. There's a lot of uh, change happening here in America, not just uh, as a result of the pandemic, but uh, certainly the recognition of Black Lives Matter and uh, people taking to the streets and acting. And what we need to have happen, of course, is also to act on climate change. Uh, uh, much of the opportunities that we have as we come out of the pandemic represent a, a doorway into accelerating the possibilities for climate change attention and taking action. This past April, we had a chance to have a week-long gathering uh, that the Clean Tech Business Club organized, bringing together 150 leaders from uh, all around the world. Uh, over 35 countries were represented and uh, came forth with a declaration for uh, looking at a clean tech decade challenge and how we can address that challenge. Part of the uh, links that will be uh, shown uh, will allow everyone to uh, circle back and look at the videos that were recorded during the course of the uh, e-convention. Uh, a lot of the insights that are shared there are uh, available to everyone. And it's a great connection point for not just thinking about our own needs here in the US, but the global needs because we only have one planet and much of what we can do is to learn from each other. I think there will be learning at the edges, which means that uh, people in one part of the world who have insights and ideas about how to change their local environment, especially uh, addressing self-reliance and becoming independent being able to generate low cost electricity with photovoltaics and increasingly being able to store that electricity as a result of the rapid decrease in the uh, cost of battery storage, which is accelerated because of the adoption of electric vehicles. This is a global change. This is a change that uh, means we have a great opportunity in front of us to redefine how we approach the future together and how to share those experiences. Declaration is being signed by uh, the leaders of uh, all of the countries that participated in that week-long gathering to commit ourselves, to recommit ourselves, to take action, to do what we can to collectively as well as individually to uh, improve the quality of life for future generations. Uh, the uh, rate of change that we see happening uh, is something that we can address well with the tools that have emerged over the past 40 years of work on the basic sciences in uh, clean energy technologies. Now we need to bring in uh, a more holistic collection of stakeholders from the finance community in particular to help us mobilize capital to be able to implement those changes that are now uh, technically proven and uh, require implementation. 
Here in the United States, we definitely have the uh, opportunity in front of us to be a leader of the clean tech decade. Uh, it requires commitments by government, by cities, by corporations, by utilities, and by each of us individually to take action. Among the things that um, I've spent my time doing has been mentoring, mentoring uh, students uh, who are interested in entering the field, uh, mentoring uh, entrepreneurs who are looking at starting up businesses, and ACES really represents a great convening point to catalyze the connection for entrepreneurs and for students to get further engaged in addressing what we can do with solar to uh, meet the challenge of climate change. There'll be a uh, live Q&A session that I'll be a part of at, uh, later on, and I look forward to uh, uh, fielding questions at that time. Thank you again. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, and now I'm happy to turn the floor back over to Scott for any final questions and comments. Oh, yes. We're hold on a second here as I get my little video camera back on. Unbelievable. Okay, now we have a panel discussion. So I hope I can get all these panelists with their little cameras on, uh, looking, uh, you know, impressive here. And um, we have, uh, okay, we have some time left, not a lot. But uh, what I'm hoping to do is, uh, in this conference with 100% renewable energy, I mean, Dennis, I'm gonna go uh, sort of to you first here and just sort of say, um, one of the reasons, you know, I took my, you know, have self-powering buildings too that are 100% self-powered in my office and my home, and you did it with the Bullet Foundation on a grander scale is, you can't expect other people to walk the walk unless you do it. So I understand that. And I think that's one of the critical issues here. And by the way, everything I did was, is economic. I mean, everything I did, I say, ultimately save money. So it, it wasn't a, a ridiculous thing to do. And if we're gonna make the change, um, it's gonna to have to be those individual decisions of renters and homeowners and business owners and local government officials. So, uh, you know, is, is there a secret sauce here we have not yet hit or is it just plugging along as we've done for the last decades to, you know, get everybody rowing the same direction? What's your, your view on that? Well, as, as with you, Scott, ours, ours was all done as an economically sound proposition. It, it turns out that the bullet center per square foot costs a little bit less than the median cost per square foot of other class A office buildings in Seattle. Uh, they have Chihuly sculptures in their lobbies. They bring in Carrera marble and stick it of all places in their elevators. Uh, they have granite countertops. We don't have any of that kind of stuff, but nobody has ever walked into the building and said, oh my God, what a dump. Uh, we've done with clever design and clever use of materials ways to make things very economical. And of course, we also don't have a parking garage for automobiles, only for bicycles. And that's a, a huge expense that we were able to, to lay off. In the process, we have been fully rented from about two months after the commissioning of the building. It's all been rented to commercial firms like Sonos, the wireless speaker manufacturers, Intentional Futures, and PAE. Uh, we charge uh, now it's actually less than the median charge for other Class A office buildings in Seattle. And um, because after seven years, the cost of building new ones has been going up and <laughs> our investment is already made. Having said all of that, uh, the, the economics notwithstanding, we could not get a single bank to make us a regular construction loan for the building. So we had to put up the foundation's portfolio of stocks and bonds to cross collateralize the loan. Um, when we went back for permanent financing and had several years then of economic operation, we were able to get fine permanent financing, but, but we went to eight different banks asking for a construction loan and nobody would do it because we were seen as too risky. Um, and, and I, I guess all of this is saying, yeah, if the thing is economically out of the park, nobody's going to be able to do it. 
But having proven that it was economic, we had sort of this idea that you build it, they will come. And it's been out there now for seven years. The first similar building in the United States is being, hopefully is gonna start construction before the end of this year in Portland, Oregon. That'll be two buildings in seven years. So I, I and, and we've got lots two of- Two cities that have hardly any sunlight, which is amazing. <laughs> yes. Just so, unbelievable. Uh, we, there are all kinds of things where uh, we've been able to get the city to give advantages to builders who will do this. They go to the front of the queue for building permits. They get certain financial advantages. And it hasn't been enough to nudge industries into doing things differently. And, and you've had a lot of Dennis, experience. Dennis, I'm going to need to nudge you here. I'm sorry. Uh, we do need to wrap up. I, I apologize for cutting you off. But we virtually have another session that needs to get into this room. Um, but I, I want to give uh, Tomas uh, a, a minute to, to speak. Okay, so just one minute. So I will just very, very shortly, this is the, one of the most touching moments in my life because when I started in solar 16 years ago, I would never expect uh, to be in one meeting room with Scott, with Dennis, with Dave, with Charlie. So this is so amazing. And I think, uh, Carly, you feel the same, yes? Yep. because we are, I started actually in the European organization, but uh, I would like to just show one slide, yes, which is a bit uh, summary also of our discussion, because uh, we noticed in the presentation of uh, Scott, of uh, Dave, but also in the talk of uh, Irina, that everybody speaks about Horizon 2040, 2050, yes? So let's say this is the benchmark, but actually we can prove it that thanks to the disruption which is happening uh, and thanks to the exponential growth, uh, we expect that this change will happen by 2030. And it will not only be you know, the change in the energy supply or uh, let's say in uh, uh, mobility, but it will be the change of the whole world's paradigm. And uh, thank you, Scott, also for you know, this research study from Google, because uh, I'm happy that also Google agrees with us, yes? Yes. And, uh, yes, and, and this is, I think this is the historical moment now because uh, what we are uh, doing is uh, we are putting now uh, like a benchmark date 2030 for changing uh, of the world's paradigm. And I would like to guys, I have still 10 seconds, just uh, ask you for commitment to help us to bring this benchmark, you know, to the world and to help us to spread it around the world. Yes, because I think we should not discuss anymore about 2040, 50, 60, 80, because anyway, we have proofs that it will happen, the change, but the thing is now to make this change by 2030, yes? And uh, as I said before, we, let's just not speak only about the change in the energy system, but let's uh, speak about the change of the whole world's paradigm. And uh, from our side, you can count on people from over 60 countries around the world to work together with you to reach this goal. So thank you so much, Kali. I hope uh, I didn't spend so much time. No, thank Tomas, you. you're great. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. Uh, sorry. Oh, no problem. Thank no you out there. Sorry. But, but you know, guys, as well, don't as well, hate me. Yeah. You are okay. You are okay for working with us. You know, I'm okay. Yes. <laughs> and sorry for being overdressed today. <laughs> Excellent. Do we have closing comments from Charlie Gay? Sure, I, I want to reinforce what we can do in the near term here. <clears throat> and uh, this is really a decade of attention to social equity, which we can bring at the same time as decarbonizing electricity. And one particular example of what I'm working on now with a number of entrepreneurs is creating community solar microgrids that have integrated the uh, digitization of the grid. We found partners in the telecommunications community to ally with us to make those uh, community solar microgrids uh, autonomous and self-reliant. And the entrepreneurial spirit that exists among the students now in school is something we can really tap into and build on and bring the background that we've all spoken about here today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Charlie. Um, we do need to close, but we invite everyone to join the panelists in the networking chat room.
Um, our next session is coming up in, in just a few minutes. So great morning, everyone. Thank you, you so much, Carly. And, uh, thank you so much, uh, Paulette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you so much for joining us for this recording from Solar 2020 Renewable Energy Vision, our uh, wonderful panel. I'm glad, I hope you all enjoyed it and we will have a recording of this webinar available um, for everyone to watch. And I will send uh, follow-up emails to everyone that has registered uh, with access to our recorded keynote, Clear Vision for Worldwide Action, later this week. Alrighty, thank you all and have a great day. Bye-bye.